so good. It's wonderful to be together and to know there are those joining us on the live stream as well. And today we're concluding our series, as Matt said, our series, Family on Mission. Uh, because Life Church is a family on mission. And you'll know this word for word now, won't you? Life Church is a family on mission to welcome people home to God, to raise fully devoted followers of Jesus, and to bring transformation to our neighbors, our nation, and the nations. And over the last few months, we've been unpacking our eight values as a church community. And um, our values are the, the things that are important to us, the things that, that guide us in how we go about doing what we're here to do. They are the things that guide and shape our decisions and our priorities and our methods. And so, so far, we've looked at the other seven. We've looked at discipleship. We've looked at scripture. We've looked at people. You are one of our values. We've looked at leadership, partnership, contemporary, and excellence. And today, we're going to conclude our series with participation. Can everyone say participation? Well done for participating this morning. Good job. Good start. So we're going to unpack this final value together. And, and as we do that, we're going to look at a passage from the Apostle Paul's letter to the first Corinthian, which, Corinthians, which just exemplifies this value. So participation. We all have a part to play. We all have a part to play. And so we invite everyone to contribute generously through serving, financial giving, missional opportunities, and ministering to others. So we're going to unpack this section by section and have a look at this passage. And firstly, we all have a part to play. And perhaps you're here today and you need to hear that because you've thought, I don't have anything to contribute. Well, I want you to hear this morning that we all have a part to play in this body called the church. And maybe you're here today and you need a little bit of a nudge because you know you've got something to contribute, but you're perhaps happy, sat back, letting other people do the contributing. Well, I want you to hear today that we all have a part to play. You see, Christianity is not a spectator sport where one person does it all and everybody else sits back and watches them do it. Church is not meant to be a consumer experience where we rock up every week, receive something, go away. Christianity is not meant to be a consumer experience where all we do is receive because we all have something to contribute. We all have a part to play. And that's what Paul seems to be getting at in his letter, letter to the first, his first letter to the Corinthians, when he uses this, this metaphor of a body made up of many parts to explain what the church is like. And we're going to have a look at this together. It's 1 Corinthians 12. It's going to be on the screen. And we're going to, as we unpack it, we're going to kind of draw from it. What does this teach us? How, how can we apply this to understanding we all have a part to play? So 1 Corinthians 12, starting at verse 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body, one body, is not made up of one part, but of many. Paul uses this metaphor of the human body that's made up of many parts that all have a part to play to help us understand the church, to help us understand the body of Christ. And you see, there, there, are, there are many great things in life, like the body, that are one thing made up of many parts. You know, he could, have, he could have used some other metaphors, perhaps. You know, one crowd made up of many fans. It's one, one big thing made up of many parts. One pot made up of many sweets. Anyone else, when you get to the cinema, 
You know that it makes no economical sense, but it just pulls you in. And you find yourself at age 39 tucking into the pick and mix. No, it's just me. Or you're just ashamed to admit it. It's okay. But, but you know, one, one team made up of many players. I feel like it's a week now, so I could, like, it's open. It's fair play. I've got used to the hurt. It's been so many years now. But one team made up of many players. But what is unique about the church is not only that it's one thing made up of many parts, but it's how those parts are brought together. And if, you, if your news feed has looked anything like mine over the last month or so, that has been the discussion. How do we bring many parts together to form one team? You know, I read somewhere they said maybe it's the best squad, but not the best team. How is this coaching staff going to get the best out of individual parts to treat them as a whole? And that is what is unique about the church. It's not just that it's many parts that make up one whole, because there's lots of things in life that are like that, but it's how the many parts are brought together. And we read this in the passage. It's many parts from one body, so it is with Christ. But we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. It is because of a work of God. It is a powerful work of God. The baptism in the spirit, the same spirit that is given to all, that is the how we are brought together as many parts in one body. And that is what is incredible about the church, that it is a work of God that brings us together from so many different walks of lives and experiences and situations. And together we become one body. That's what's so incredible. And it goes on to say that in this body, what is incredible? See, the part that we have to play, and I want you to hear this morning that you have a part to play. Again, if you're someone that's ruled yourself out, or if you're someone that's sat back and let others carry the load, you have a part to play. And the part you have to play is a part in the most incredible body in the whole world, in the most incredible invention the world has ever seen, the body of Christ, the church that is united across the globe and is united because of a work of God. It's a powerful body. It's an incredible thing that we are part of. And in that body... It tells us that the previously drawn lines of separation are now erased. Those that once were excluded are now included. Those that thought this is for us, but not for them, they get to see it in a new light. It says whether Jews or non-Jews, whether slave or free, they are now all one in Christ Jesus. So you have a part to play, and the part that you have to play is a part in the most powerful body called the church. I want us to grasp hold of that this morning. But let's carry on with the passage, verse 15. Now, if the foot should say, this is a reminder, it's a metaphor, because feet do not speak. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, hear this this morning, God has placed the parts, that's you, in the body, every one of them. So you can't disclude yourself from this. Every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. I think this, this next bit of the passage reminds us and teaches us that your part to play does not determine your belonging. Did you hear it says, well, if the foot says, I'm not I'm not an eye or I'm not a hand, so I don't belong. No, your part to play does not determine your belonging. The contribution 
that you make, it might not be the same as someone else's, but it doesn't mean that you belong any more or any less. Your part to play does not determine your belonging. You belong because the God who created you led you here, and he placed you here, and he purposed you here. That is why you belong. And we see, we see all throughout Christianity, we see in the economy of heaven, your doing never determines your belonging. That your doing never determines your belonging. You belong because you're loved. And you're loved because you're created. And you're created by the creator God who is the very beginning, the source, the beginning and the end of love itself. So you belong because you are long before you do. But there is stuff for you to do. Because we all have a part to play. But our part to play does not determine our belonging. We see this in... We see this in newborn babies, in the wonderful role that that babies play in a family because they're loved and they're cherished and they belong long before they can contribute anything more than a few windy smiles. They belong and they are loved. And um, in our church community, in our life church community, that's so true. And a few weeks ago, Noah Benjamin Fielding was born into our church family, and um, the, the most recent addition. And to be honest with you, he hasn't contributed anything to the community yet. You know, he's yet to make, I'm not in his first appearance, but do you know what? He is loved, and he belongs in this community, in this family, because before he's yet discovered his part to play, he finds his belonging. He belongs in this community. And what's also true about this community, and, and, I, and I love this, is that we're passionate, whilst we don't expect the newborn babies to contribute, that's fair, but we're passionate about helping children and young people find their part to play. And um, I had a little look over um, this last month, and I discovered that just this month, we have had, as a life church community, a young person helping to lead our primary school provision in Life Kids twice this month. So not wait until they're real grown-ups. We've had young people serving six times on production. So lights, video, live stream. Two young people in the band. Two young people serving as Life Kids young leaders. A young person on photography, hospitality, and cafe. I think they deserve a round of applause. What do you think? And when I say young people, you know, there might be some of us who think 30 is young. I don't know. I mean 11 to 17. So they're in secondary school or maybe they're in college. But you know what? We don't even necessarily wait till they're 11. This month alone, we've got two under 11s, one serving on hospitality and one on tech in Life Kids. Let's give them a round of applause. Because we recognize that your part to play does not determine your belonging. There are some of us who are literally babies. And and they belong before they have discovered their part to play. But at the same time, there are some of us who are very new to this community. Perhaps in a season where we're not in in a season where we can contribute. Where your contribution does not determine your belonging. You belong here. And at the same time, we are passionate about helping all people, helping children and young people discover their part to play. Let's carry on with the passage, verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. That's good. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, 
but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. So that there would be no division in the body and that each part would have equal concern for each other. And I think this next section of the passage, it reminds us if we're thinking about our part to play is that your part to play does not determine your value. That your part to play does not determine how valuable you are in this church community. It says here there seems to be an, an equality in value despite a difference in function. The function, the parts, the roles may be different, but it says I've lost my place. <laughs> Happens to all of us. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. <laughs> it gives special honor to those who are less honorable because the part that you play does not determine your value. You see, you are valued in this community. One person is not more valuable than another because of what they contribute. You are valuable because you're made in the image of a wonderful God. And you're made to reflect his image. And I just, I wonder if there are perhaps some people here today who find yourself in a season where you're not able to contribute how you want to. You're not able to contribute in, in the ways that you want to or perhaps in the ways that you did in a previous season. And for some, that might be frustrating. That, well, what use am I here if I can't make my contribution? How am I being useful to this church community? Well, I want to say this morning, if you're, if you're here today and you, you find yourself in that situation, let me tell you that what you contribute in this season, where perhaps your contribution is less physical or less practical, what you contribute in this season is showing the rest of us what it looks like to reflect his image in any and every season, in the highs and in the lows. Because your value comes from the fact that you're made by God, that you're made in the image of God. And the one thing you are always meant to do is reflect the image of God. And so if you find yourself in a season where your contribution isn't what you want it to be, let me encourage you that how you contribute is showing the rest of us what it looks like to reflect his image in any and every season. And when people look at you and they see you reflecting the image of God in the midst of challenge and frustration, it inspires others and it strengthens others and it gives other people an example of how we can walk that same path. So we all have a part to play. And just coming back to our value, it goes on to say, and so we invite everyone to contribute generously. We invite everyone to contribute generously. So here at Life Church, we unapologetically invite everyone to play their part. Because we want to build a, a church of contributors, not consumers. Because consumers miss out on the blessing that Jesus refers to when he says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And consumers miss out on the heart of the gospel and the heart of God and God's plan for them, which is not just to receive what he's done, but to pass it on to others. And so we invite everyone to contribute generously. Years ago, I heard this um, leadership principle which stuck with me and I've tried to adopt it, which is don't say other people's no's for them. You see, when you don't invite someone to get involved, when you don't ask someone the question, when you don't give someone the dignity to say yes or to say no, essentially you are saying their no for them. So we've decided we're not going to do that. We're going to invite people to contribute generously. We're not going to say their no for them. But at the same time, we work hard to create a healthy environment where you can say no where you can say no with the question posed to you. We won't answer the question for you, but when we invite everyone to contribute generously, you can say no in a healthy environment, in a healthy way, for healthy reasons. So it's, it is an invitation. It's a choice, not an obligation. You can say no because you don't have to, but you get to. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I've, I've been in environments and settings where the qu a question is posed, but you don't really feel like you can say no. 
And, you know, the, the, the language that's used or the way people respond leaves you thinking, technically, I appear to have a choice. But in reality, I don't really feel like it's safe or comfortable or like I can say no for a valid reason. I don't know if you've ever been in an environment like that. And so the yes doesn't come from a joyful heart, but it comes out of guilt or fear or obligation. Well, we're passionate about making sure that we don't say no on behalf of other people. But then when posed the question, we create an environment where you can say no. You can say no in the right way for the right reasons. You know, sometimes I think we find ourselves saying no for the wrong reasons. You know, because it costs us, or it's inconvenient, or it challenges us, or it pushes us out of our comfort zones. Those are all reasons to say yes. And sometimes I think we say yes for the wrong reasons. Perhaps, you know, we're so programmed to please people. Perhaps we think it just couldn't operate without us. Perhaps we um, put enough having that difficult but necessary conversation. Perhaps we find ourselves um, just not recognizing when we're over committing. Well, we invite everyone to contribute generously. We're not going to say people's no's for them, but we also want to create a healthy environment where people can say no for healthy reasons in a healthy way, where everyone contributes as they're able. And so if you find yourself in a season where you can't contribute, that's okay. It's a healthy place where we can do that. And the value goes on to say, through serving, financial giving, missional opportunities, and ministering to others. There are loads of ways that we can serve. Financial giving, we talked about that earlier this year. Loads of missional opportunities. And when we talk about ministering to others, that's the way that we pray for and encourage and care and support each other. And this happens in our small groups and our wider church community. And so the invitation to play your part is to be part of one body. To play your part is not, it's not a free-for-all. The liver doesn't suddenly say, right, guys, let's all do what I want to do and kind of hop off out of the body and go off in his or her, I don't know what gender the, um, the liver is, own way. This is, not an, this is not an opportunity. This is not an invitation for a, a free-for-all. This is you get to play your part to pull together to be the body, to work together for the prize, which is seeing people come to discover Jesus. And so all of this happens within healthy boundaries. All of this happens with leadership support and good communication and ongoing accountability. Because for health and wholeness in the body, all the organs need to not only play their part, but to work together. I wonder if the band could come and help us as we draw to a close this morning. what I'd like to do is I'd like to illustrate to you what this, this value could look like in the life of our church. And the band are going to help me with this. Why don't we give the band a round of applause for the way they serve us. <laughs> what I want to do as we draw to a close this morning is to, to illustrate what this value could look like in the life of our church. You see, when we accept the invitation to contribute generously, then it's like we're all sharing the load. It's like we're all taking a bit of responsibility. We're all sharing the load. We're all playing our part. We're turning up as contributors, not consumers. And so instead of one person trying to carry the weight alone, which may be possible, it appears, but it's not sustainable and it's not healthy. Instead of one person carrying the weight alone, when more people accept the invitation to carry the load, what we find is that the weight is shared. Suddenly, what seemed really hard is almost effortless. 
But I don't know about you, but what I've seen sometimes in, in churches over the years is things look like this at one point, but then for some reason, someone has to put their load down. Someone has to step away. It may be really good reasons. It may not be good reasons. And so a little bit more is left to the others. And then a little bit further down the lane or down the road, down the path, wherever you want to walk down, someone else, for some reason, has to step away. And so what was essentially four people sharing the load becomes heavier as two people share the load. Because the load is not shared as equally as less people, for whatever reason, accept the invitation to contribute generously. Now let's imagine if one person feels like they're, they're in a season where they really need to put this down. Because there are seasons, aren't there, where we're not able to contribute in the way that we want to, in the way that we would love to. And we have to recognize that. So let's imagine one person is in a season where they, they want to put it down for really good reasons, but they think, if I do that, what happens to him? It's all left to one person. Or maybe it doesn't happen at all. Maybe the table just crashes to the floor. So it's okay, I'll carry on. Because I don't really feel like I can say no in this season. So I'll carry on, and I'll carry on, and I'll carry on. And who knows, that becomes unhealthy. That becomes unsustainable. That impacts the team, the church, the project, the department, but it impacts the individual. They can become exhausted, maybe burnt out, resentment. Why has no one else come to pick up this side of the table? Why am I carrying this weight when I'm in this season where I really need to put it down? Well, I think if each of us grasp hold of this value, this, in fact, is what it could look like. If everyone accepts the invitation to contribute generously, then it is a beautiful picture of team, where together they carry the weight, they carry the load, and the load on any one person is not significant. And so if one person perhaps realizes they need to step away in this season, maybe it's because of a, a family bereavement or challenges at work, or I really need to focus on my studies. I, I get that we contribute as we're able, but I'm not able to in this season. Then they can do that knowing that the rest of the team, the rest of the group, the rest of the church will carry the load. And the impact on everyone else is minimal because they're each sharing a small part of it. And maybe somebody else realizes, actually, I just, I need to step away for a season but because there's, there's a new grandchild coming into the family or um, I've got a promotion at work or I've just retired and I'm going on a three-month cruise. Anyone? Sounds good, doesn't it? It's a little way off. But that person can do that knowing that the rest of the team have got it. That when I do that, I'm not leaving one person on their own trying to carry this weight. And the impact on everyone else is minimal because they are sharing the load. They are sharing it between them. And when we do this, we, we, we live out this final part of the verse. I wonder if we could have this on screen. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If so, when, when one is suffering, everybody else feels it because we're so interconnected by our contribution. But when, if one part is honored on their three-month cruise in retirement, then every part rejoices with it. It impacts. We celebrate with them. We rejoice with them because our, our contribution, recognizing our part to play, connects us in such a unique, special way that the Apostle Paul calls the body of Christ. Why don't we thank the team? We'll let them get ready. They're not just here for the muscles. They're going to lead us in worship in just a moment. Thank you, guys. You know, there's, the, there's a principle, there's a generally accepted principle that in most environments... 20% um, of the people do 80% of the work. 20% of the people do 80% of the contribution. And people who um, talk about churches and study churches and write about churches would say this happens in churches too. 
that 20% of the people make 80% of the contribution. And so in light of that, we wrote our value and said, we invite 20% of you to contribute generously. No, we did not. We're saying, not at Life Church. That's not how it happens here. We invite everyone to contribute generously through serving, financial giving, missional opportunities, ministering to others. Because when we do that, not only do we have such an incredible experience of serving together, rejoicing together, supporting each other when they suffer, not only is it a lighter load to carry, but what we're able to actually do as a church community is so much greater. And as a church, we are a family. And so you matter, but we also have our eyes on the people who are not yet part of this family. We're passionate about welcoming people home to God. We have a mission ahead of us. And when each of us contribute, as we are able in any given season, then together we achieve that more greatly. And church, I want to just invite us to reflect as we conclude this Family on Mission series. So you may want to, uh, you may want to close your eyes for a moment. Just open your heart, maybe your hands. Because over this, over this series, we've looked at discipleship, and being a follower of Jesus, not merely a fan. We've looked at Scripture, humbly studying the Scriptures to discover our part in God's plan for creation. We've looked at people, to really love people with the love that comes from God. Is it leadership to lead the Jesus way in our homes, our workplaces, and the communities? We've looked at partnership because we recognize that God's mission is so big, we can't do it alone. We've looked at contemporary how we find new ways for people to encounter the real, radical, relevant person of Jesus. And we've looked at excellence, doing the best that we can with what we have so that God would be honoured in all we do. Today, participation. So we all have a part to play. So the invitation is thrown open again. Generous contributions, welcome. To serving, giving, missional opportunities, ministering to others. This is how we become a family on mission.